Okay, welcome everybody to the GQRP Club convention for 2022. Uh, delighted to be able to say that we're doing a first for the GQRP Club in having participants both online and down at Telford at the Telford Hamfest. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Nick, uh, G4IWO, and I'm hosting the online part of it. Over in Telford, uh, on the screen, we've got our speaker, Martin, uh, GM5JDX uh, on camera, um, and on the microphone behind him, chairing the meeting down at uh, Telford, is Steve, the GQRP Club Chair, G0FUW. So um, just before I hand over to Steve, uh, we're starting with Martin now at 11, and then we're going over to a presentation from Steve at uh, midday, on the GQRP Club Scratch Build project. And then at 1.30, uh, a uh, introduction from Michael of MI5 MTC on the work he's been doing, the written work that he's been doing of uh, the uh, writings of George Dobbs, uh, G3RJV. So Steve, if I hand the microphone over to you and I'll let you take it away from down in Telford. Thank you very much, Nick, and um, a warm welcome to everyone online and in person. This is uh, a first for, uh, for this particular convention. We did something similar in Northern Ireland in June. Um, we've not managed to get those videos processed yet, but uh, we will eventually get them online and people can watch them. But uh, uh, welcome today. Um, Nick's covered most of what I was going to say, other than to say a, a big thank you to the Telford Hamfest crew. We've got a couple in the... Uh, in the audience now. Uh, without them, we couldn't do this. So uh, it, it, it's, it really is a, a fantastic team effort and, and lots of people involved over a long period of time. And to the university to say thank you to them, who have been terrific hosts, uh, giving us the facilities. And uh, um, well, I think everybody will this is a great venue for uh, uh, this kind of event. So uh, hopefully, I know it's already booked for next year. So we'll get that in your diary, first weekend of September. Um, so end, end of shameless commerce uh, division, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sometimes called. I'm going to hand over to Martin. I've known Martin uh, for about a year, but it's the first time we met yesterday um, because a nice link here to the next presentation. Martin is one of our scratch build group, um, but he revealed that he knows a little bit about things like Arduino. So I asked him if he'd be prepared to do the talk today. And um, I'm not going to see him in front of me. He'll introduce himself and tell you what he's about. Uh, so without further ado, over to Martin. Okay, thank you. Is that unmuted? Yeah, ready to go. You're good to go again. Thank oh, you. by the way, if you've got any questions, um, I'll pick them up at the end uh, because we need to get the microphone to you so the online audience can hear you as well. We can go back on the questions that we get. Okay, thank you. Thank Steve, you. you're not sharing yet. Just before uh, Martin starts, Steve, you're not sharing the um, participation yet, the, uh, this, the PowerPoint. Okay, one moment. Cool that good? Absolutely fine. Okay. So good morning. Um, my name is Martin Evans, uh, GM by JDG. Um, I'm, as you can tell from the course time, I actually resident up in northeast of Scotland. Um, but interestingly enough, I was actually born a few miles from here, down in Wellington. Um, but I was only there for about two years, and I was sort of mainly in Birmingham. I've been up in Scotland for sort of around about 30 years. Um, I've been a developer in hardware and software, mainly software for a little over 30 years. Um, as a company, I run a, a, a social enterprise called Digital Maker. And we do tech workshops for disadvantaged children. Um, I'm a fairly recent radio license holder. Um, I took the advantage of lockdown and the move to the online exams to sort of go through my entire the various licenses. Um, this is the only plug I'm going to do. This is a, a book that I wrote in um, 2012, 2013, um, Arduino in Action. Um, um, I'm pleased to say it's been. Um, converted or translated into a few different languages, and I still get a very small royalty from it. So this is the agenda, this is what I want to be looking at today. So initially, what is a microprocessor, microcontroller? 
Um, things to think about when you're choosing a microcontroller. Um, why a microcontroller? Um, brief history of the microcontrollers in radio. I then want to look at sort of a simple range of some of the microcontrollers that I've sort of had not played with. Um, we have a look at a few examples then where they're actually used in radio. Um, a couple of ideas of what um, ideas for further study, and then at the end, just several questions. Swapping, so, I'm swapping the um, things. So, uh, this is a microprocessor, um, which is a digital integrated circuit, and that has got data, address, and then got timing instructions. And this is a microcontroller, and that's a special class of microprocessor. It's a class of microprocessor, and that's primarily the sort of thing that we're looking at today. So, very, very simply, this is what is in a microcontroller. So, you've got a, a CPU, which is the main brain. Um, there's memory, so that's going to be storing programming data. Um, clock, so that keeps everything all regular. Um, then there's input output ports. Um, over time, they've been getting more and more sophisticated and more and more specialized. And we'll have a look at some more, you know, a bit more detail of those in a, in a little while. Um, but I want to look at some choices, about things to think about when you're choosing a microcontroller. It might seem about, we don't actually talk about microcontrollers yet, but I think these are sort of important to do as well. Um, so it's when you're doing a project, so you think about speed. And the microprocessors is what we're going to look at with the microcontrollers we're going to look at today. I mean, they have a range of speed from 16 megahertz up to then about 600 megahertz, so that's quite a range. Um, they also have cores, or that's the number of processors that they can do at any one time. So a good example of that is if you've got, say, two cores, one could be updating the display, and the other one could actually be doing mathematical calculations like Fourier transforms and stuff. And when that data is ready, then the other core can then present it. So it just makes things faster and more efficient. Memory, um, various types of memory. There's sort of low speed, very high speed, and stuff with data. But it's where the program stores or where the code actually runs from. Um, if you've got a, a display with lots of images, then you need more memory. If you want to do lots and lots of functions, again, you need more memory to be very memory intensive. And this is where the input out, but this is, I'm not sure how clear that is, but this is um, an Arduino Nano, and that's an example of the different pins. A lot of the pins actually are multi use. Um, there's nothing else to mention is that. The actual voltage of microcontrollers, they tend to be either 5 volts or 3.3 volts. And there's more of a tendency for the newer ones to be 3.3 volts. So just something to be aware of if you're interfacing things with it, with what voltage that they've got, what you're trying to do. Um, there's a UART normally for serial data, so transmitting and receiving of data. Um, SPI, which is their serial peripheral interface, and that's quite often used for displays. Um, I squared C. Um, and that's used for a lot of big control, um, control, so variable frequency oscillators. Um, you can use it for temperament, temperament measurements. So there's different peripherals, and they'll have separate addresses, and you communicate with those. Um, I squared S, which is the digital audio input and output. Um, there's quite a few processors that have got that built in now, so that makes audio much easier to do. And then you just the general purpose inputs and output things. So that's things like switches, you can actually switch relays, so it's you know, impact either way. Um, some have got analog to digital converters or digital to analog converters, and they have different resolutions. So you have to think about that when you're choosing your controller. Another thing is language. And this is just an example of what heaps of different programming languages, but uh, traditionally most like controllers have been developed either using assembly, which is very sort of close to the actual machine language, um, or a high level language like C. Um, so the early microcontrollers, they often were coded in assembler, although some did use a variant of basic. Um, Python, I don't know if you're familiar with Python, but that's actually becoming more and more used. Um, and they've got its own version that runs on microcontrollers. Uh, there's two main versions, which is Circuit Python. Um, and that's organized by um, Adafruit, which is a company uh, based in New York. That's all open source. And there's MicroPython. And they're very similar. There are some stuff of differences, but basically they run Python. Um, and they're both designed specifically to run on microcontrollers. Um, but if it's more speed drafter, then assembler will be the fastest. 
closely followed by C and then Python probably after that, although there are heaps of libraries for that. Another thing to consider is sort of like your, your text editor, so it's like a word processor. And this is an example of the integrated development environment of Arduino. Um, it's free, multi platform. It's basic, but it's highly functional. I mean, this basic interface has been around for 12, 13 years now, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and it works, it's really good. Um, this is another example. It's much more complicated, it's sort of more complex. It's uh, one that I particularly like, and that's VS Code. Again, this is the free download. Um, again, it's multi platform, it's highly configurable, and you can add you know, sort of extensions to make it work with different languages, and you can also use it for sharing of your source code really efficiently. Um, libraries. So these are a great way to add functionality. So these are things, bits of code that other people have written. So you can you sort of find lists, particularly the Arduino ID, you just whole lists of different functionality. And you can pull those into your own code. Um, so if you're doing a project, it's worth looking at what libraries are available. And also to have a look to see if they've been regularly updated. Um, it's quite often sort of like features or bug lists, and you can sort of see how those been fixed, how timely they've been fixed. Um, and there's some libraries that just seem to be able to use, but it's, always, so it's worth having a good look at that. Um, the other thing is community, and that can sort of make you a very a microcontroller. Um, so that's sort of like, if you get stuck, where can I get help? Are there active user groups that you specialize in that microcontroller? Um, forums. Um, there's online communities, for example, groups.io, um, Raspberry Pi have their own forums, and Arduino also has forums. So those are really good places to look and see what problems or what projects other people are doing. But to summarize, there is a thing that we look at speed, memory, language, input outputs, the development environment, whatever you're comfortable with. The libraries and what communities around that project do for sort of doing that microcontroller. So, why why bother with a microcontroller? Cost can be an influence. Um, you can reduce the number of discrete components, particularly in a multi band radio. Um, one example you can replace um, analog audio filters by using you know, both writing code within your microcontroller. Um, any digital signaling pro um, digital signal function processing function site, they can all be performed in software and the Zara or microcontrollers are particularly specialized in that. Um, you can inexpensively provide features that more that much more expensive commercial radios. Complexity. So you can reduce the complexity of your radio architecture by sort of moving a lot of the things onto a microcontroller, particularly sort of the processing side of the, the, the signal. Um, you can quickly make changes in software and test it without sort of having to rebuild any PCB. Um, so one example is uh, a variable frequency oscillator. This is a typical analog VFO with lots of discrete components. Um, that's been replaced pretty much with this, um, which is the SI5, so 52518, and that's got three individually controllable outputs. Um, this above example, I think it's the RP labs, works with both 3.3 and 5 volt logic. Um, it's readily available as a breakout board. Um, it has less drift, higher stability, and it's a simpler design. Another thing you can do is like sharing. <clears throat> so code can be easily shared electronically. So if you sort of fix a bug, you can very quickly share that and people can then try it out. Um, so improvements, features, quickly test, you can debug. Um, and it's also easy to work together in groups. They can like set up little groups and if you work together, you can work on shared code, work on particular features and then put it back into the main body. Have a look at the, the history. <coughs> when I was preparing this talk, I was searching for some old stuff for I actually came across this book that I remember swapping, I think it was with a next door neighbor when I was there. Uh, I think it must be his granddad. But uh, this was originally written in 1922. And 
It's full of really concise instructions on how to build this equipment. And it actually details all of the individual components. If you want to do it and buy them, you also have pricing if you want to make the individual components. And it's full of like all these diagrams, and you can just follow it through. I think it's just, just showed where we were sort of in 1922, where we are now. Um, and another great resource was Sprat. And I think that acts as a history <clears throat> in 1974 of how radio has developed and changed from looking for the after. I had um, a Sprat on a, on, a, on a stick. And it was really fascinating how you started off with this handwritten journal to what's produced now, produced nowadays. But there was two articles that particularly stood out for me. Um, the first was this one by Paul 9H1FQ. Um, this was in the spring edition, 2009. And it had to start with the microcontrols. This was actually a pickaxe, which was a version of basic. Um, outline, simple instruction. And I thought that was indicative of where the people were at that time. And an example of projects that people could do with this was they could make more decoders, frequency meters, tone generators, you know, a lot of test equipment. And then just a few years later, in August 2013, was this article by Paul of Ockham's microcontroller. Um, and that was talking about this, this Arduino. And this was in the autumn 2013, so just four years later. Um, it discussed the original PIC microcontroller, the PIC X. And this was, to, this was a, a new version of the Arduino, just there it was the, the, the Arduino, you know. And it, from the off, it was designed to be easy to use. It was actually designed originally to be used by art students. For their final year projects, they sort of wanted to sort of move things, and it was like, how can we make this really easy for them to do? They've got like these fantastic ideas, and so the Arduino was built from that, developed in, in, in Italy. And it's all open source hardware, um, and it, this was then very quickly adopted by Radio Ham in different versions, but we'll cover that And one example is back to variable frequency oscillator. This is the AB nine eight five zero. Um, and this couple with microcontroller, you've got direct digital synthesis, signal generator module, uh, really stable sinusoid output. Um, it's used by QRP labs um, in their earlier leaking kits. Moved on. And this was one of the saw, saw earlier. So this was a cheaper, more efficient replacement. I think if I remember right, it was actually cheaper to buy a complete board than it was to buy the individual chips. Um, three highly configurable outputs. Um, and Hans was in the dark and Sprat in spring 2016. So again, we've done a couple of years. Um, the version here, this is an, um, an Arduino. Sorry, this is an Adafruit breakout, um, but it's readily available from lots of different retailers online, AliExpress, etc. This is easily controlled by a micro, sorry, by a microcontroller, and there's lots of really good examples online. Um, and there's lots of really good libraries to actually really simply drive this as well. There's more. The actual process, because of the processing power, it only needs a little bit of processing power to run something like the, the VFO. Um, so you can do all these other things as well at the same time, all individually. So when you're doing a project, you can particularly very much be useful for my project. So you've got your ATU. Here, display, um, frequency input, rotary encoder, and um, you can get the signal strength to the ABC, uh, uh, standing wave ratio, power, water pool, and the list can go on and the people sort of thinking of these notch filters and all that sort of thing. I want to have a quick look at the range of microcontrollers. We'll start with the, the PIC. So this is now it's sort of that melt microchip, the microchip in the main body of it, the main organization that do it now. And the reason it was the peripheral interface controller, and that was later known as the programmable intelligent computer. Um, so there's a variety of, for instance, and there's a surface mount version. There's also dip sockets as well. Um, huge range, low cost chips. It uses its own IDE called MP Lab. And the language you write that in is C or C. Um, and you need the programmer additionally to upload it. So like there's a pick pick three, which I think is obsolete, but you can buy copies online. Um, they work quite well. Um, but this was primarily used in 
radio peripherals wasn't used so much as a, an actual integral part of the radio. So it was, it was like you sort of tested it and turned generators and so on. But it was thought it was too difficult to use a pick. The original ones, they tend to have to be programmed in assembler to, to going back in time. So this was developed, which was a pick, but with a what was called a special bit of code on it called a bootloader. And that meant you could write code in basic, which was perceived to be easier to use. Um, they're still available, and there's a variety of chips, there's a range of starter packs. I think they sort of run around about the 70, 80 pound mark. And speed wise, they're running at 32, 64 megahertz with various memory sizes. Um, so they can be programmed in basic, they've got their own editor, or you can use VS Code, which I've mentioned before. Um, so it's a mature platform, it's been around a long time. Um, and that's so it's used for mainly for peripherals. This was the Arduino that I mentioned before. Um, the official board rep for an Arduino costs around £20. Um, but as I said, it is open source, so people are quite free to make their own versions, which they have been, so copies can be had for around 14 The main processor, or the, the main brain, it was the 18 mega 3 to 8 p um, And that's, this runs on a 16 megahertz clock with 32 pin memory. And as you see, actually, that's quite small by modern day standards. Um, but coupled with the Arduino ID, it's a fantastic development environment. There's heaps of libraries being written for it. Um, and there's a massive online community uh, with lots of examples of how you can sort of adapt it for using your own projects. Um, you can expand it by your add on boards that you can plug into it to add extra functionality. Um, I'd say it's very mature, and there's new versions in development, although they're looking more at IoT and that sort of thing. I think that's the way sort of things are going. This is the one that really became popular, I think, with radio hams, um, which is the, the smaller version. So it's a small factor, small form factor version of the Arduino. Um, visual version costs approximately about 21 pounds. And you can get copies for around about 11. Um, price it had gone up in 12, 18 months ago, you get you could buy them for about three pounds each. So with component shortages, everything's sort of just going pleasing. Same as the original as the original Arduino Uno, it's 16 megahertz with 13k RAM. Um, as I say, it's become a popular option for use for radio homes, because of the small size. They have produced a version called the Nano Every. It looks exactly the same, it's actually a slightly different process. It's peer compatible, but it's not actually software compatible. So it's something that is cheaper. Um, I fell down from my board, I was so you get a bit of money there, and I tried to get a rotary encoding. Nothing was happening. So I had to sort of, there are libraries that fix that now, but it's something that's very like it's not. If you have some of these code that we're using with an Arduino Nano, the yeah, everything might not be as worth it, you know, to figure it. Um, if you're using this in your own projects, I would suggest using plug-in headers to plug it into. Um, so that makes it a lot easier to replace if or when you release the magic smoke. That's something that happened to me, part of the uh, the, scr the scratch field group, I actually smoked something and it was like, oh no, I solved everything, so I did it from scratch. This is a TNC 4.1 um, uh, and this costs around well, it's a little bit more expensive, um, but I think this is a fantastic microcontroller. This is using the Neural Cortex M7. The speed of this is something like 600 megahertz, so you can get 600 to your 16. I think it's you having my headphones on. Huh? If I do. Okay. Okay. Right. This, <laughs> this has got heckled from the world. Anyway, so this, is, um, float, this has actually got a floating point unit on it as well. For are sort of speedily doing the mathematical processing. Um, you can also purchase an audio daughter board that fits on it. So you can feed your IMQ um, into that. Um, and that costs around £15. So this is small form factor. It, it develops, uses the same development environment as the Arduino, but it's actually got a slightly version, it's called the Teensy Arduino, but it uses all the same libraries. Um, excellent support. Unfortunately, there are supply issues because of the chip component shortage. So they are being released, but they're only being released in small quantities. Um, 
You can buy them in the UK. I think it's all components do them sometimes in Taiwan or other suppliers, um, or you can just buy them straight from the States. But they are, I think they're fantastic. And I think that's probably the future that people should probably be looking at using. Um, this is the STM32. This is actually what's called the Discovery Board. And this is these have got a range of prices, uh, anything from eight to 25 pounds, depending on the board. Um, so this is ST Microelectronics. This uses a similar processor to the Teensy. It's part of the ARM range, it's an earlier version, this is the M4. And this has got a clock speed up to 180 megahertz. And if you're buying one, if it's got an F in the description, that means it's got floating point processor in it. Um, when they come in a range of things, this is a, what's called a discovery board. So it's got heaps of inputs and outputs on it. Um, and they also do a small form factor, which is called the blue or the black pill. Um, uses its own development environment for the STM32 cube. Um, again, you can also use the RD and OID with it. And this can also run circuit Python and micro Python if you want to use that as well. Um, this was the ESP32, between some of you heard about this. Um, and this is a complete development board like this can be purchased for around £10. Um, so it's an expressive system. This was the first one, the first processor really, apart from this, it was in 8266, but this is the first, this size that got built in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, speed is 240 megahertz and it's available in a range of many sizes. Um, this is dual core. So again, you can run those two processes at the same time. And most of the GPI pins are configured to other things. Um, again, you can use the Arduino ID with this, and you can use it with circuit Python and micro Python. There are some new versions becoming available for the CS3, which are slightly enhanced capabilities. Um, and this was, I put, I put this in the new kit on the block, January 2021. Um, but they have just released a new version that has got built in Wi Fi. That's the Pico W. Um, that for. Um, this uses the RP2040 processor, um, and that's stored with a number of derivatives. This is using an ARM Cortex dual core, and I think that's so that hasn't actually got a floating point, which is a bit, which is a shame. Um, and this is 133 megahertz, uh, I think it's two mega memory on this, or you can get them to about eight meg. Um, it's programmable. Um, it's got these what they call them state machines, and they can be used in particular ways to make processing faster, and they're quite unique for that. Um, they've got a huge established user base to the Raspberry Pi. The documentation that comes with these is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's a massive download, it's got the whole specs. Um, you can use the Arduino IDE, or you can use VS Code, um, and you can, you can also use Circuit Python. And micro Python with it, and again, a small factor. And the other thing is, it's dirt cheap, it's like six pounds each. Um, so, and they're very, and they are readily available. I'm going to mention this for completeness. And these are actually difficult purchases for Pi 4s at the moment. You can get them as a kit with other stuff around about 70 quid. Um, it's not a microcontroller, it's a microcomputer. Um, but I, as I said, I wanted to mention it. To, to show it's been used in radio. This is quad core, ARM Cortex running at one and a half gigahertz, and you can have a great new memory on this. Um, there's a number of different operating systems. Some of them have been specifically designed to be used by radio amateurs, but you can download that, and that's got all the normal programs on it for the users of the radio hands or things like um, this one did FDA, the WSDA, so it's all pre uh, pre done, so you don't actually go and play it yourself. So that can save huge amounts of time. I'm going to get a few examples of different items or different pieces of equipment or using these different processes. And this is the first one. This is a PIC. Um, and this is the QRP version of the ATU100. So this is, this is the max of 10 watts. Um, this uses a, a pick with a little floating point. So, really, it's for using it for displaying what your SWR is, and it's also used then for switching relays for different inductors. Um, so, we've got, I think, that size of a cigarette packet, but it's really quite small, quite neat. And so, we're going back in time a bit. This was the MCHF, uh, first released in 2013 by M0 MKO. 
Now, this is a direct conversion transceiver. Uh, the current version is 0 0.6, 0 0.3. And this uses an SC microelectronics processor, and that provides the display functionality and also some digital signal processing functions. It's got uh, notch filters, uh, noise reduction. It, it's highly configurable. Um, I built mine from a kit last year. Unfortunately, it's currently unavailable, um, again, due to component shortages, although it has spawned a number of Chinese copies. There's QRP labs. I think you're all familiar with these. Uh, so the single band, this uses the same processor that's in the Arduino and the Arduino Nano, which is the 18 mega P2AP. Um, so this is a direct conversion. Uh, it's a quadrature sampling detector, like a Taylor detector. And this uses the SI53518 synthesizer that we've spoken about previously with the rotary encoding tuner. Um, I think the documentation from QRL is fantastic. I really like actually the sort of quite often it actually even includes the design decisions for different parts. I mean, the sort of clear thing exactly how everything's working. Um, and the built in test equipment, I think that's sort of really. And for the site, you've got a 16 megahertz chip with 32K functionality in that. I think that's really incredible. So I think he's really pushed it to the limit of where it could go. Um, and I said, with the comprehensive documentation. QDX, I think this is been, uh, this is quite you know, 12, 18 months, I think it's been out. So this is your quad band digital transceiver. We were speaking about this and I agreed to this yesterday. Again, we've got extensive documentation. This is changed to different processors. So this is using the STM32 F. So it's got floating point. But it's also got digital signal processing built into it. So it's reducing the component count for the overall radio. And again, it's got a floating point unit. This is a show SDX. So this was actually derived from the QRP Labs QTX. Um, I think actually ended up looking at quite a lot of the components, leaving some of it. Um, and this, this is itself then a spin off of the micro SDX project. So this is a five band multi mode QRP transceiver. Um, you pair it in the USB to 5 milliwatts out. If you use an external 13 volt power supply, you're looking at four to five watts output. Um, available as a kit for a box 50 foot. Um, I built one as one of the first of the UK group purchase. It works really well. The, the sound is not good, but if you use an external speaker with it, it's, it's got a little tiny speaker and it's pretty poor. And so you put it up too loud, it's really, really, really good. Um, again, this is using the 18 mega 32, so it's the same process in this. Of what's in the Arduino um, and control for the VFO is the SR53518, and also that drives the display. Um, so the, the, the hardware for this is all open source, but for this particular version, they, they've made the, the firmware for the actual the code is actually closed. So you can't, there are, if you build the micro SDX, you can change the firmware. If you're building this version, then it, it's all closed. Um, they, they're doing that because they want to try and limit the number of copies, Chinese copies. Um, there is quite a good forum for support. And there's quite a few builds of these around the world, and there's quite a few other group, group builds happening. This is uh, the latest incarnation in incarnation of the Ubitex um, by Farhan. Um, this is multiband, low cost. And this uses an Arduino Nano as its main controller. And again, it's with the SI5351 for the voltage. And this gives up to 10 watts output. And this is only just released. And this is the SPTX, again, designed to be low cost. Um, it doesn't use a microprocessor, this uses the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, but that's a seven inch touch screen. I think you can use a 10 inch touch screen as well. Um, so you've got a nice large screen. Output is up to 40 watts, so it's not strictly QRP. You can turn it down. Um, this is being really rapidly developed. Um, so release, I think if you're buying it at the moment, you, you have to more treat it as a development project as opposed to a fully complete thing. Um, but looking at the user group, there's people working on the software and it's been updated on a almost daily basis and it's been fed back into the main into the main project. So I think that could be quite nice in the future. Looking, I think 
I think you can have a kit with that, with like a price about 400 quid or something like that. So it's not, it's not expensive. Um, you can buy these complete units. But a complete unit, I think it was like 450 or something, because you don't pay huge sums of money for the Raspberry Pi 4s. So where to start? <coughs> I hope I've written the Raspberry Pi 4, maybe you left that really wet here. So if I was you, I haven't done any work with microcontrollers before, I choose a simple project you can use on a breadboard. You can buy all these as little breakout boards. So you have an Arduino Nano, SI53, few switches, and an and a, and a ice grade C display. Um, and I'd use this to get used to editing, writing code, how to upload it to the microcontroller, how to download, and how to do both. It will make mistakes. Um, so this, use this as a really good learning tool. Um, you could use a Pico instead, just on a cost basis. Um, and there's lots, there's lots of online examples of how to build these. And this is a project, um, PA0RWE. And I think we've got more details actually built on it on the website. So my recommendation, take it with a pinch of salt if you want, is basic project, start with a nano, cheap, easy to set up, loads of examples online. Um, you want to go advanced without going to the expense of a Raspberry Pi 4, I'd be looking at a TZ 4.1 um, coupled with an audio board. Um, and I personally think that that's just going to be some really good radios coming out on that, on that based on that platform. Um, so it's a good support. It is worth a look though. <coughs> it's a Raspberry Pi Pico, cheap. Because it's cheap and there's a massive user community and also use all the Arduino libraries now. Um, and there's loads of, I don't know if you're familiar with Git Hub, it's a way of keeping code online. And there's loads of, there's loads, there's a lot of nano projects that have been converted to use the Pico. Um, so that's worth a look. Further study is, I really like this book, um, which is by Jack Purdom. It's well written, really easy to read. He's a radio amateur. It covers a C language in a lot of detail, and it's got heaps of hardware examples. Um, and I, I, I've just found it really good. And uh, shows how to set everything up. Um, this is a newer book of his, which is the software designed radio transceiver. This is using the TZ. This was only released a couple of months ago. You can buy it from Amazon. Um, they are, as they're finding errors in the documentation, it is being updated. You can download the errata, but they are, I think the books are already printed to order. So they tend that the newer books have got all the, the, the documentation fixes all of them. Um, it's a really good book because it explains a lot of the concepts of sort of fast Fourier transforms, the digital signal processing in really clear detail. Um, it is being developed, it's ongoing development. Um, it explains his design decisions, why he choose lots of switches as opposed to a rotary encoder. Um, and as I said, it covers a lot of the advanced topics. Online, and again, this is place where you can actually look for help and assistance. Um, there's Discord, and that's good if you're using stuff in Python, like the Game Circuit Python, I just don't use that as, a, as their support forum. Groups.io, some of the ones I recommend on there would be the BitX20, which is for hands radios, including the S BitX. Um, there's UCX, 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 sorry, um, software, software control hand radio, which is the last book that I showed you that's on that radio. Um, there's forums from Raspberry Pi, um, and also the Arduino. Um, you find that people are really sort of, I don't know, quite responsive. As long as you ask the right question, and actually you don't expect them to do everything for you. And then you find that you get a lot of good feedback on that. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. So if there's any questions, you know, see if we'll lose around with the mic. Quite often the questions are nicely in the background. I Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 
really good. Um, before I talk to the room, have we got any online questions yet? Uh, we haven't got any online questions yet, Steve. Your your audio is not brilliant from your end when you came up there, Steve. So if you can put the microphone closer to yourself. But um, I have sent a message out in the online room to people either to raise their hands if they've got a question or to send me a direct message. So none yet. So proceed in the room for the moment, Steve. I will see anyone in the room with a question for Martin. Over here first, because maybe you are over question. Yeah. Simon, you can see the road to the other screen. Uh, when do you get your book? Oh, my book, um, Amazon. Right, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. You, or, or if you want to go, if you want the PDF version, you can go direct to Manning Publications. Um, I, I've just got one question about the last item, the theory of how do you know you've got the latest version of the gift book? They've got, um, I think there's, 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 a, there's a date in the book. But if you actually join, if you, actually, if you go on to the groups.io and look at the forum, you can ask the question there. I think they tell you when it's up. Right. Order, order on Amazon, you might get the early version. From what I can gather, it's the way they're doing it, you're more likely to get the latest version. Mm -hmm. You can download all the, the data. Separately, anyway, you can look in the back of the book. That's what I've done. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, Dave Magnol, yeah, you press MLR. This is all sort of magic to me. They say, through SDX, and I would be interested in this if I call a war support. I really don't know where to start at all. Where would somebody who's still in the 1980s start? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. Um, do you have any coding ability at all? Any no. Code? None at all. So I wouldn't start with a waterfall. Okay. Okay. I'd start, as I said, doing the very bulk of so doing start with a nano or a pico and a breadboard and the um, SI5351A and start to see if you can control that. Um, once you've got that, then we were still looking at for the water pool, you're looking at sort of what's um, on the analog to digital side. Um, so you'd be probably looking on for some different way. Probably the teams is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, and I'd get Jack's book actually because he has a lot of explanations in there on how to do a lot of that stuff. Okay. More. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you for your talk today. In terms of the marketplace activities and marketing projects, I think we need to have a few barriers and how many expenses to push it in. How do you find out about the model of trade and maybe what you have? What do you recommend to take a model of that? I've got no particular recommendation on that offhand. A lot of them could be. Some of them you're sort of building your own discrete circuitry and you're measuring it as a, as an analog voltage. Um, so it's, it's it's not one size fits all. Um, I, again, I'd probably look online and sort of see what's 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 been done out there already. So there are some online resources that you can download. Yeah. Yeah, for ADC stuff up the Pico has some some issues, so that the nano is probably a better version for that. Steve, I've got a question from online. Okay, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, Bert uh, WF7I has just posed the question: as a total beginner to microcontrollers, a good project would be the PA0 RWE circuit you mentioned and the nano. Yes, correct. I'm going to put it back on. Yeah. Is that more of a, a, a cultural saving in the question? Than <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you go to that, 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 that web page, it, 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 it explains it really well how to put all that together. That's not the only example, I and mean, there are lots of other examples as well, but I found that one I thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How's it going, Andrew? Days late. 
Um, different um, I'm very new into the project as well. And one of the books that I found interesting in was with Simon Monk. Yes. Um, yeah. and he, if you draw on you take it right from the very early ways and read the things, downloaded his code as well. So you can go in there and say anything that I think it's right. So mention that as my experience. Yeah, Monk, uh, Monk, Monk makes, I think, is how he presents himself. He's done quite a few books on electronics and stuff. So yeah, really good. Okay, well, we need to swap over to the next talk. So uh one final question you had or are we all done? Anything else online, Dave? No, no one else online, Steve. Okay, in that case, I will defer this talk close. Could everyone show their appreciation to Mark? <laughs> Thank you.